After months of wearing out the enemy, the Ukrainian army has launched a counteroffensive in the country south in an attempt to retake the city of Kherson. The regional capital fell in the first days of Russia's invasion, and since then, a resistance movement has been operating in the shadows, taking out Kremlin collaborators one by one. Kiev is tight-lipped on the troops' progress, but has said that they've broken through the first line of defense. While the Kremlin maintains that Ukraine's counteroffensive has failed miserably, or while reportedly preparing annexation referendums across the occupied territories. Does Ukraine have enough firepower to drive out the Russians? Will the West live up to its promises? Or with munition stockpiles reportedly uncomfortably low, even in the US, will Kiev be left to fend for itself? Is this the beginning of the end, or the end of the beginning? And before we begin the discussion, allow me to correct uh, myself, a man of many titles, but now the correct uh, one, retired uh, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, senior advisor, uh, human rights first, and also uh, former commanding general of the United States Army in uh, Europe. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for your time, and apologies for the mistake. So let's get to it, uh, dear uh, panelist. Is it the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning? You know the rules, 30-second uh, round, uh, quick-fire round, uh, if you will, uh, each, and then we dive into the conversation. Uh, so. Uh, Lieutenant General Hodges, please take the lead. So for this conflict in Ukraine, this is the end of the beginning. Uh, Russian forces are exhausted. Their logistics are exhausted. Ukraine has the momentum. But I would also say for the Russian Federation, we are seeing the beginning of the end of the Russian Federation as we know it. I don't think five years from now it'll look anything like it does now. Wow, that's a prediction that uh, is uh, worth uh, um, uh, expanding on, and we will do that uh, in just a split second. Uh, Dr. Celeste, your take? You know, I would say it is none because uh, the problem is we have the counter offense on the south, but the general line of the fighting as for now is around uh, 2,000 kilometers. And the situation on the northeast, east and south is quite a different. So as in any conflict, because it is really over, we can't say it is end. But at the same time, we are quite far from the beginning of mm. anything as the warfare and the fighting are very fluid, is changing uh, almost hourly. If not daily. That's why I will be very moderate in the assessments. And last but definitely not least, Mr. Dan Perry, uh, your thoughts? We seem to be in a war of attrition, and these things can last for a very long time when both sides are very motivated. And the question becomes, which one of them is more um, more susceptible to pressure? And I have to say, I think that's probably Zelensky, because he is not the dictator in this equation. And pressure may come because of the winter coming, which is going to affect not just the troops in the field, but especially the Ukraine's allies in Europe. Yes, and uh, the uh, time of the season definitely uh, plays a major role here. Here, And uh, we will get to that in a, in a second. And feel. Please feel free uh, to engage in a conversation from this point uh, onwards. Uh, Lieutenant General Hodges, uh, the Russians uh, claim this counteroffensive is too local. It is merely tactical. Is that so? Well, I would say that we only know what we are seeing right now, and the Ukrainian general staff has done a great job protecting information. Uh, we know more about the Russians than we do about Ukrainian forces, which is as it should be. Uh, I think there's much more to, to we're going to learn in the next few days. But for the Russians to claim this is local, of course, they're ignoring the fact that even uh, sites in Crimea and their logistical installations uh, throughout occupied part of Ukraine are being hit. So uh, a lot, lot more to learn here in the coming days. But Dr. Shalas, maybe it's not just the interest of the Russians to disguise, so to speak, the current state of affairs. Maybe the Ukrainians uh, would like to maintain this ambiguity as well, perhaps disguising uh, its lack of uh, military capabilities. We, we don't really have the no uh, as for the scope and scale of the, uh, ab the military ability of the Ukrainians. There are two points, if you allow me. First Please. is about the situation on the ground. We are trying to monitor the local uh, social networks, the different telegram channels. Uh, and it's quite an interesting to see the reports of the population about where the fire, what of the uh, place with the stockpile of ammunition, for example, being targeted or where they saw explosions because they post a lot of videos. Definitely some of these videos should be rechecked. But at the same time, it gives us the picture that... Uh, 
as for now, it is definitely not the attrition. It is the quite heavy fighting since Sunday, because previously you could see, for example, one explosion per two day. Now it is the 10s and 20s, and they are not only around the Kherson city, but all around Kherson region, in Genichinsk, in Novakakhovka, in all those quite strategic, important in terms of changing the uh, battle picture and the situation on the ground. Plus, you started to see the explosions in Crimea, and that also was very important in terms of cutting Russians from the uh, supply of the ammunition. That was changing situation on the ground. But definitely, I agree with General that we don't have all information as for now, and it is a request of the Ukrainian general staff not to publish a lot, because that is important for the uh, further advancement and development. But we already know, uh, confirmed at least four villages that Ukrainian armed forces liberated. So we understand that the certain advancement is happening. The second point I would like to respond to my co-panelists from Israel about the Ukraine being under the bigger pressure. I would disagree with this. The reason is that in Ukraine you have the uh, better motivation. Ukrainians understand why they suffer. They understand why the higher prices or why we probably will need the lower temperature in our flats this winter. Because the moral is high, we understand we are defending our land and our people. For the Russian Federation, it is much more difficult because uh, uh, even those soldiers that have been captured, most of them couldn't really answer why they are why they are fighting. And all the interceptions that we have the last days, we see these. It's not a panicking, but a certain de demotivation that is mm. increasing. Our Western Look, partners, that is definitely more difficult uh, situation. Mm. But at the same time, today we have the meeting in Prague and the statements from most of the leaders of the European Union countries mm -hmm. that they are ready for the price that they need to pay in the next months. Look, I have to say, uh, first of all, on a question of what's happening on the ground, in, in a, a war situation, we need to pretty much discount what both sides are saying. I mean, Russia at this point is going to lie no matter what. That's the nature of that regime, and I think we just have to accept it. If they say one thing, it's more likely the opposite is true. In the case of Ukraine, I mean, what's the bigger motivation? Speaking the comprehensive truth or uh, winning uh, the battle of hearts and minds and maybe creating a cloud of confusion and feel for the Russians? Obviously the latter. So that's in terms of the information. As for uh, your point, Hannah, look, I of course I know that Ukrainians are more motivated than Russians don't know what on earth is going on. Their media is propaganda and their I mean, brainwashing is massive and they live under a criminal regime. That's clear. However, one of the basic unfairnesses of life in this world is that when you have a conflict of this nature, it's easier for the, for the dictatorship. Uh, Putin doesn't have to take public opinion into yeah. account at all. And Zelensky does. I mean, Ukraine is not a model democracy, but Zelensky does have to take public opinion into account, and the people are more likely to know what's going on. So they may be very motivated now, but come the winter, uh, as the losses mount and uh, damage, and you know, I mean, all kinds of damages are going to attach, mm -hmm. and the West may become less resolute in its support for Zelensky and for Ukraine, and, and they're going to want to look for a way out. Things might change. And, and speaking uh, of which, uh, Dr. Shalesta was speaking about the Ukrainian morale, but uh, General Hodges, the Ukrainian bid is not just to serve uh, Ukrainians, but also uh, its Western allies uh, that uh, you know provided huge amounts of weapons and, and ammunition to Kiev and an extensive successful counteroffensive would mean a lot in this respect in, in continuing to encourage Western allies to provide the needed support and also not to put extra pressure on Ukraine to make some painful compromises. And in this respect, General, what would qualify as a successful campaign? Well, the successful campaign is Russian forces uh, this year pushed all the way back to the 23 February line, which I believe is going to happen. And then uh, by next year, Crimea has returned to Ukrainian sovereignty. Uh, President Zelensky has made this very clear. The war started in Crimea. It's going to end in Crimea. The United States has said that Ukrainian sovereignty is a priority for us. So I think that you're going to see the United States continue to support Ukraine. Um, and I also think that you're going to see West, even Western European countries continue to support Ukraine. I, I live in Frankfurt, Germany, and of course, um, all my German friends are talking about gas prices and so on. But even in Germany, I have seen an increased resolve. More and more people are willing to, to do what's required because they are so turned off by what the Putin regime has done. And actually, to their credit, the German government has figured out how to uh, almost completely disconnect themselves 
from Russian gas. So uh, another strategic failure by the Kremlin. General, are you not concerned about the nuclear question? If Russia defeated too badly, uh, might turn to threatening at least? Do you think they're bluffing when they talk about nukes? Yeah, I, I do believe they're bluffing. Of course, they have thousands of nuclear weapons. Uh, they're dangerous, um, and I don't dismiss it, but I see no benefit for Russia to use a nuclear weapon anywhere inside Ukraine. Number one, there's no battlefield advantage for them. They, they can't hardly kill more civilians than they're already killing. Uh, number two, the, uh, the United States and probably the UK would find it impossible to stay out, uh, to not respond to a use of by Russia of any nuclear weapons. So that's that's a, a change that Russia would not want. And I also think that while Putin is completely evil and should burn in hell forever, <laughs> I don't think he's suicidal. And uh, I don't think that uh, the 70 or so oligarchs that are keeping him in power want to see him drive off the cliff either. So I, I just don't think it's feasible as long as we're talking about a use of a nuclear weapon anywhere right. inside Ukraine. It, it, it isn't clear to me if the oligarchs keep Putin in place or Putin keeps the oligarchs in place, but certainly they would hang okay. together if they don't, uh, you know, if they don't, they would hang apart if they don't hang yeah. together. Uh, uh, I'm also, re I'm really curious to hear what the general thinks Russia will be like in five years. I haven't heard that Well, uh, General, uh, you have uh, 40 seconds before uh, we wrap up this part of the debate. Okay, well, of course I could be wrong, but I base this on the fact that uh, their population is unhealthy and shrinking. Uh, they have a brain drain going on there. The world, or most of the world, certainly Europe and the U.S., are moving away from reliance on Russian energy. Uh, the, the military has been exposed for its corruption and its many failures. Uh, not too many people are going to be interested in buying Russian defense industry products after what they've seen the last six months. And so I think that um, all the vulnerabilities that are there inside what's left of the Russian empire, the, the various colonies, if you will, see opportunity to break away. And so I think we're going to see the balkanization. We need to be prepared for the possibility. Yeah. We were not prepared for the breakup of the Soviet Union. Yeah, so well, uh, speaking, speaking of the uh, Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, we will, of course, uh, address uh, the uh, passing of uh, the less Soviet uh, leader right after the break. Dr. Uh, Hannah Schellest, uh, General Hodges, Dan Perry, you're staying with us. We're taking a very short break, but we'll be back with much more right after it, uh, so don't go anywhere. Uh, Lieutenant General uh, Ben Hodges and Dr. Hannah Thank you all very much for staying with us. We're also staying on topic, but before we dive back into the conversation, let's take a quick listen to the latest from both Kyiv and Moscow. The Russian war against Ukraine and against all of free Europe started in Crimea and has to end in Crimea by its liberation. It is impossible to say when it will happen, but we are constantly adding the necessary ingredients to the formula of Crimea's liberation. We heard nothing. They are not contacting, not negotiating. President Zelensky is saying that the condition to negotiate is uh, full Russian withdrawal from the territory of Ukraine, and that does not limit. Uh, he does not limit it uh, uh, to, to, to the current status, but uh, to the previous one as well. He lost appetite uh, to negotiations very early in the conflict, very early on in the conflict after after the heavy uh, Western support with uh, armaments uh, that followed uh, from the West. Uh, and we clearly see no appetite uh, for, for negotiations from him uh, now as well. So let's uh, get to it and begin with another quick fire round of uh, 30 seconds uh, each. Will the war be determined by war or by force rather or by diplomacy? Dr. Shilas, please take the lead. You know, the history shows that any conflict finishes by some kind of diplomacy. The question is from which positions we're sitting on the negotiation table and what results we would like to have in the end. The worst when you had just uh, win-loss solutions, that's probably something from the 18th century. Even in the 19th century, you already had uh, the big Versailles or Berlin Congresses to decide the future. And in the 21st uh, century, that is even more. The question is that definitely if uh, uh, one of the sides are coming just with the ultimate in this case, there is not that much what to discuss. General Hodges, your take? Well, it's going to be a combination, obviously. Uh, Ukrainian battlefield success plus sanctions 
are going to create huge uh, popular unrest, I think, inside Russia. And there will be pressure on the Kremlin to uh, come to a, a resolution, which will include giving up Crimea. Uh, but Hanna, of course, is right. A war is always in with some sort of a diplomatic a, an agreement of some sort. Wrong answer, though, to, to put pressure on Ukraine to stop now. It's way too early. And that's uh, perhaps uh, a point to emphasize later on. Uh, Dan Perry, your take? I agree with both. It'll be a combination. And look, there are scenarios that go in both directions. Um, I have to say uh, it's possible that the war will end with the overthrow of Putin. And, um, you know, we're here to be analysts and not activists. It's conceivable, even if not desirable, that the pressure will grow on Ukraine to sue for peace, essentially. So we could go in a lot of different directions. And um, from this point onwards, please feel free uh, to interact freely. Um, and uh, I want to discuss this uh, new uh, intelligence uh, uh, report uh, by ImageSat, this international satellite uh, and intelligence solutions uh, company, revealing that uh, Russia is also positioning, uh, deploying rather, um, uh, in the area of Kaliningrad region against the Baltic states. So is Ukraine merely, uh, a st will, will Russia stop in Ukraine or is Ukraine merely a stop for Russia, so to speak, general? Well, look, the Russians do not have the ability, the logistics or the wherewithal to launch a new offensive anywhere, uh, particularly against NATO in the Baltic region. This this is all just to draw attention away from things. Um, I mean, their command and control structure is such a mess. They have not corrected the problems that we saw six months ago. They still haven't figured out who's doing what. Uh, so they, I would say that uh, there is no significant threat of any sort of offensive going towards the Baltics. They need everything they've got just to hang on to what they have now in Ukraine. Uh, General, if I may, I, I fully agree that it is unlikely and they're overextended as is. And um, I, I don't think they're going to attack the Balkans, uh, the Baltics rather. And uh, it's pretty clear, though, that they have an interest in saber rattling in order to scare the West into doing just what I claim is one of the scenarios, which is to desperately look for a way out. And that would involve pressuring Ukraine at this point. Uh, that said, that said, Russia basically is run by one man. I don't think the 70 oligarchs you mentioned are, have that much of an influence at this point. The whim of Putin will drive a lot of this. And uh, Putin uh, clearly is running a satanic regime. And there is a scenario where, you, where the narrative is that he cannot afford to lose. And he's willing to burn down a house and have a tenth of all Russians die just in order to save face, which probably is necessary for him to stay in power and thus preserve his own life and that of his family. So this is a rather desperate situation where you have a deterministic environment surrounding one man. Uh, I'm not sure that, that I would agree with your approach to this whole situation, which is basically, I think, which is uh, at, at the core containing the assumption that we're dealing with a rational player. And Dr. Shales, uh, another uh, uh, front that is uh, currently underway, Europe does not want Russian tourists, and there is this ongoing discussion of the uh, visa uh, 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 ban. But uh, some countries, even though we don't see this uh, one-size-fits-all foreign policy on that, such as Poland and Finland and, uh, and uh, some Baltic states are saying, you know what, we will move ahead with that regardless of an EU decision on the matter. Are we seeing first European cracks? Uh, no, definitely not. But first, if you allow me Please. to follow the Kaliningrad issue briefly, uh, we should remember that just recently, Mr. Medvedev, the ex-president, said that it's nothing about NATO and uh, Russia will be ready to go further uh, from Ukraine. And the reason is that Finland and Sweden, after so many decades or even centuries of neutrality, decided to join NATO. So for Russia, just to save the face, they need to bring some forces closer to the Baltics closer to the border with Finland to demonstrate that they are not desperate in terms of their military uh, power. So we will see more of these, uh, not only bringing uh, forces to the Kaliningrad, we will see some navy maneuvers probably or some provocations on the north. That will be just for the demonstration that they are still strong, uh, but not uh, with the limited uh, capabilities and capacities as they brought all the weapons from the north now to the east of Ukraine. So that's definitely will be and we are expecting an even more by the
the end of the year. Now, when you speak about visa, first of all, the uh, uh, position about visa is uh, not the cracking inside because the general position against the Russian Federation is uh, completely the same. None of the countries is changing it. The problem is that some countries think that banning Russian visas can have the uh, negative effect to those Russians who are dissidents, who are against the regime, and probably will need them for the humanitarian purposes. So that is more about the human rights and the national security, the battle between these two rather than the crack between the countries. And uh, before we uh, need to um, uh, conclude uh, this uh, debate, um, uh, Mr. Dan Perry, we can't ignore um, the latest development, uh, not unrelated, uh, the passing of uh, Gorbachev. And um, you have some uh, personal takes on that and also uh, perhaps a very evident dilemma by Western leaders, whether to attend a funeral and pay their tribute or not risk boosting the current Russian strongman. I mean, this is a very tragic situation all around that uh, Gorbachev, an icon, a titan of the 20th century, has died and he may not get a state funeral in Russia. I mean, he's despised and Putin's supporters uh, in Russia despise him especially. And even if uh, Western leaders were allowed to go to Russia, I'm not so sure they would go because that would perhaps be interpreted as a victory for Putin. But honestly, poor Gorbachev, uh, I mean, I spent an hour or two with him about a decade ago. He... he <laughs> He, he wanted, he was naive in many ways, but he wanted to yield a better Russia, a Russia of good karma. And we currently have a Russia of horrific karma. And it's almost sad that he spent his last months watching the, uh, the a real undoing of everything he had hoped to achieve. Never mind that he himself uh, sort of blundered into the collapse of the Soviet Union. He hoped um, in his last months in power that uh, the Soviet Union can be saved by improving it. And I can assure you as someone who's spent a lot of time in the former communist world, that idea was preposterous.